Hi, I'm Paul Merriman, a retired investment advisor, and when I retired and sold my company in 2012, I took part of the proceeds and started a financial education foundation. And my job in the foundation, and it's what I'm doing here today, is to teach people about better ways to invest. Figure out how to get a better rate of return for the risk that you take. And so today I'm going to focus on value investing. A way to invest that from my almost 50 years of experience have, has led me to believe that it is probably the best unit of return per unit of risk. So let's talk about the most important investment objectives that, that the individual has in putting together a long-term plan. It's not about what's hot or, or wh what the market's going to do for the next year. It's all about the long term. And what do we know about the long term? Well, in the long term, we need to each one of us figure out what is our need for return and what is our risk tolerance. And once we figure that out, then we want to find those equity asset classes that represent the growth that we need along with the amount of fixed income that we need in order to stabilize the portfolio during the toughest of times. And then we're going to build a portfolio in that equity area of all of these past winners. See, we know what's been the best in the past. What, of course, we don't know is what will be the best in the future. But you put together the best you know from the past because that's all you've got. And you're going to make a decision either by design or by chance. You're going to make a decision. Are you going to overweight to one particular stock over another? More big or small? More value or growth? This is a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal is because, for example, Vanguard has $200 billion in target date funds. And guess what? Almost all of that money is basically growth-oriented and is basically large. So that's a big decision. And by the way, I'm not sure it's the right decision. So let's talk about the difference between growth and value. Growth stocks are, are popular stocks. Uh, they're, they're in fact, remember back in the late 90s when technology was all the craze. Well, boy, those were growth stocks. Stocks with the anticipated increase in, in sales and earnings and oftentimes in popular industries with strong financial positions. That's a, a great combination. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the out-of-favor value stocks, the stocks that aren't popular, maybe in industries that are out of favor, maybe industries that are facing challenges with government agencies, or maybe in particular companies they've got a problem with management. It could be any number of things. Sometimes it's something as simple. Back in the late 90s when technology was so hot, Warren Buffett was not. As a matter of fact, there was a period that Warren Buffett's bricks and mortar companies lost about half their value while the S&P 500 was doing well. So growth and value, huge decision for the investor. And what's interesting to me is that when we look at a list of the, the, the most famous managers of all, they're almost always value. Certainly, we know Warren Buffett as a value investor. And we know Benjamin Graham, who was the father of security analysts, who was actually Warren Buffett's teacher. And it is supposedly Warren was the only one to ever get an A-plus from Benjamin Graham. Well, he, he's obviously done well with whatever he learned from Benjamin Graham, but also Peter Lynch, not known so much as a value investor. That wasn't the hype around him, but if you look at where he made some of his biggest money, 
it was when he bought a company that was not only out of favor, but was on the verge of bankruptcy. That was Chrysler. And he made a huge amount of money on Chrysler, buying around $3 a share, and I think selling around 30 Those 10 baggers don't come very often. And maybe in some ways the most interesting of all the value investors, John Templeton. John Templeton did something really interesting. Many years ago, he was one of the first investment managers, public managers, who went overseas. And how did he buy value? He bought stocks in a company, a country, I should say, that had a, a reputation for making products that didn't last very long. And so you could buy companies at very, very low prices compared to their book value. That happens to be Japan. Now, Japan turned it around as a, as a country, just as lots of companies go from being out of favor to in favor. And he made, in fact, he made so much, he, he became Sir John Templeton in the end. So let's talk about how we can identify value stocks. Most investors who buy individual companies are, I'll say, overconfident. This is what the experts say. We're overconfident about almost all the important parts of our life. And investing in individual stocks, we tend to be overconfident and think the companies that we're buying are not necessarily identified as growth or value, but the fact that we're buying them by default makes them of value because we think they're going up. Now, that is one way to identify value. But there's no way to test the past to see how your kind of company or that you might perceive to be a great company, how that, could, how that would hold up over decades to see if that strategy would work. But there are ways that, in fact, the academics have tested what is value. One way is to look at the P.E. ratio, the price to the earnings. And those companies that have low price earnings ratios, in other words, people aren't willing to pay very much for those earnings, those tend to be out of favor companies. Another way, and according to Dr. Fama and Dr. French, the best way to identify value is by buying companies that the price is low compared to the book value. Remember I talked about John Templeton over in Japan. Well, the reality is, is that uh, John Templeton was able to buy companies at half of their net worth. Now, that's, that doesn't happen today, but I can tell you that if I looked at the Vanguard uh, growth index, the P.E. ratio, by the way, the P.E. ratio is around 24, as opposed to their value index around 17. And uh, if you looked at the book value, that price to book value with growth, it's about 4 to 1, and with value about 2 to 1. So there are ways that the academics, and I think academics are the most trustworthy group in terms of leading us to learn how to invest more effectively, but that is a big difference between the 2 to 1 and 4 to 1, and the academics will show us that time and time again, the 2 to 1s beat the 4 to 1s. Now, by the way, there's a reason why people pay 4 to 1 for those great growth companies, because they're on a path to greatness. Unfortunately, as many of you know, that greatness isn't always achieved. Now, it turns out that the more deeply discounted, more out of favor that companies are, the more they tend to make, historically. It turns out that smaller companies that are out of favor make more, historically, than larger companies that are out of favor. And here's the good news for those of you who really want to dig deep into this. Morningstar offers us at no cost all the information that we need to decide is a company growth, is a company value, is it big, is it small, is it mid, is it U.S., is it international. You can dig as deep as you wish, but the numbers are there and easy to get access to. Well, let's talk about the S&P 500. That's the benchmark. 
That's what people know in the U.S. as the market. And what do we know about the S&P 500? Well, it turns out that it's a blend of both growth and value. So when you have money in the S&P 500, you do have some value. But the fact is that more of it is growth than it is value. And that's because the S&P 500 is what they call a capitalization weighted index. In order to give each company value in that index, they multiply the price per share in the market times the number of shares that they've issued. And that means that high-priced, famous growth companies are going to have a bigger share of that S&P 500 than will a, small co a smaller company that's likely out of favor, that w people aren't willing to pay very much for. But the S&P 500 is the benchmark. So if I'm going to look at some numbers to see how, how, how value does compared to anything, probably the first thing to look at would be the S&P 500. And what do we know since 1928? That that index has compounded at about 9.7%. And for those of you who are fans of the total market index, the total market index in the U.S. going back 80-some years is almost exactly the same return as the S&P 500. And I love questions about what's a myth, what's a reality. In fact, I've got a list of over 100 of them. But one of them is that the S&P 500 is a difficult index to beat. And I think most of us believed that for a long time. By the way, it was easy to believe because from 1975 to 1999, that index compounded at 17.2%. That was making so much money that you might not have noted that small cap value compounded at 22% over that same period of time. But because not many people had a lot of money in small cap value, they were comparing their portfolios to the S&P 500 and the S&P 500 was doing just fine. Now, of course, what followed that 25 years of amazing returns so far are 16 years of very mediocre returns. It, it, it actually has been about a 6% compound rate of return. So if we're going to really look deep, if we're going to dig deep here to find out how good is value, how does it measure up to the S&P 500, let's look at at the market one year at a time, going back over the, back to 1928. Let's see what happens if you invested in the S&P 500 in large cap value. Remember, the S&P is growth and value. Well, what about a large company group uh, uh, index of, of just out of favor companies? What about a small cap portfolio, smaller companies, very small companies compared to the S&P 500, maybe on average 125th the size. But what about a blend of growth and value there as opposed to a pure value index? Well, here's what we know. Over the last, uh, what, 88 years, uh, the compound rate, uh, 89 years, the compound rate of return, 9.7, large value. 11.2. 11.2. Are you getting an idea why Warren Buffett may have done better than the S&P 500? That's part of it, certainly. It just, because these things are out of favor, there is additional risk. There's no question there's additional risk, which is why you, which is why you don't want to buy them one at a time. But as a group, to have done way more, I mean, what, one and a half percent. A half a percent over a lifetime each year is life-changing. One and a half percent, that's huge. If we look at small cap blend, 12.2 percent. If we look at small cap value, 13.5. And here's the scary part. If we look at the volatility one year at a time, I don't know who would want to be in the S&P 500. Because if you ask me, Paul, what do you think the market's going to do this year? I would say, well, from what I know about the past, since I see the best year is up 54, and I see the worst year is up 40, uh, down 43.3, I would guess that next year the market will be somewhere between a negative 43 and a positive 54. And you'd probably say, thanks a lot. That, that really pins it down. 
Well, one year at a time, you just don't know how wild and crazy it can be on the upside, how wild and crazy it could be on the downside. It's the same with large cap value. Notice the best year was a gain of 92 and a half, the worst year a loss of 61. One year at a time, equities, I'm not, I don't care if you're talking about the S&P 500 or small cap value, small cap value, the best year was up 125%, the worst year down 55%. That's a lot of volatility. So I don't ever recommend somebody invest in the stock market for a year. In fact, it may not be wise if you've got money for something special like a down payment on a house to even put money into the market over a five-year period. The risk can be so high. So one year doesn't really matter, except when you live through it, it does, right? Okay. How about looking at, looking at 15 years? What do we see at 15 years? Well, for one thing, we're going to see that the spread between the worst 15 and the best 15 is very small compared to that being down 50 or up 50, whatever. Look at the U.S. large cap blend. That's the S&P 500, the worst 15-year compound rate of return going back to 1928 was a a basically a break-even, a gain of 0.6% a year for 15 years. Anybody going to retire on that? Well, I, I suspect that that would not be fulfilling the uh, expectations that you had. You wanted to see it more like the best 15 years, which is a compound rate of return of 18.9. But notice we have gone from a huge spread down to a very f re relatively narrow spread by going out to 15 years rather than one year. So now... Like in my case, I'm 73. I'd be happy to get 15 more good years that I can remember. But here's the reality. It could be a 15 years I don't make anything on equities. Or it could be a life changer, not for me, but maybe for kids or charities that we leave money to when we're gone. But 15 years is kind of my view of the future. But when I'm talking, of course, to a 20-year-old, we're talking about 60 years ahead, and, and that changes the whole view of investing, at least it does to me. But look at what happens to the compound rate of return. Average compound rate of return for the S&P 500, 10.8. For large cap value, 13.1. For small cap blend, 13.7. And for the small cap value, 16. Now, just for fun because we're always trying to find ways to diversify, that way trying to minimize the risk and maybe come up with a better return. Look at the four fund combo, 25% each with the S&P 500, the large cap value, the small cap blend, and the small cap value, 25% each, and the compound rate of return was 13.6. Now that's compared to 10.8 for the S&P 500. I'd take that combo any day of the week for somebody who's got 15 years. Notice the worst 15 years was virtually the same as the worst 15 years for the S&P 500, the difference being a, a more than a 2% uh, difference in the compound rate of return. I, wait a minute, that's 3%, not 2 and If you want to do better, and this is what led me to start thinking about all-value portfolios, that led to this presentation, look at the two fund combo. Throw out the growth. Just leave yourself for the long term with a portfolio that's a combination of small cap value and large cap value. Oh, you'll have plenty of companies, and you're not going to be able to brag about all of them, but, but, but you will have diversification, thousands of companies in your portfolio. And notice the worst 15 years was virtually the same, within a percent or so of the S&P 500 and the four fund combo. But the compound rate of return is up to 14.7. Life-changing, truly. Particularly if we can get to people young enough, and that's what the 40-year view is about. What does it look like over a 40-year period? Well, Compound rate of return for the S&P 500, there it is again, 
Compound rate of return for large cap value, 13.5, 13.8 for small cap blend, and 16.2 for small cap value. And the longer we look, the more dependable the returns, at least looking backwards, because we see the best and worst for the S&P 500 was a spread of 8.9 to 12 and a half. Let's look over at the four fund combo. The best and worst, the worst was 10.8, the best was 15.9. Looking at the two fund combo, the value, all value, U.S. only, 10.7 to 17.2. Actually, the worst 40 years was for the two-fund combo is about the same as the 40-year uh, compound average for the S&P 500. All I'm saying is I'm looking for the best unit of return per unit of risk. And when we can go out 20, 30, 40 years, the risk at the end of a long period of time on the downside is not much the difference is likely to be on the upside. So let's talk about how risky these value stocks are. Because they are risky. Remember, they're out of favor for a reason. It's not a miracle and that you have found this company that is sitting there and it's a gem and nobody realizes it. No, if its price is out of favor, there's a reason. Now, the reason may be psychological in the minds of millions of investors, but there's still a reason. So one at a time, these value stocks are risky. And in fact, the experts say that if you looked at all of the companies that are out of favor today, let's say based on that price to, to net worth or price to book ratio, if you looked at all the companies that qualified for that, what you would find is that five years from now, about half of them would still be dogs. It's the other half that makes the difference. And the experts say that there's no evidence that there are experts out there that know how to pick the good out of favor companies from the bad out of favor companies, which is exactly why the experts recommend that you, in fact, can get the premium at low cost and broad diversification by simply buying index funds. Because the index fund might own a 500 out of favor companies, or in some cases, two and 3,000 out of favor companies. And so if the expected premium is going to come from the mass, why start taking the risk of underperforming the greatest asset class that we know? And I think it's important to understand something, and that is that these value stocks, in a way, have already gone through their bear market, and that's important. Because here's what's one of the things that is right with value stocks. One of the things is they do tend to perform better in a bear market, oftentimes because they've already been through a bear market when the bear market for all stocks tends to happen. What does that mean? Well, it's, there's a table. You can't see it here, but it's in the supplemental package that I hope all of you will take the time to go through. But if you went through and, and, and looked at the 73-74 time frame for the S&P 500, it's in what we call the fine-tuning table, you would see for 73 and 74 total loss for the S&P 500, including the reinvestment of all dividends, was a loss of 37.3%. All value, there's another table for all value, a loss of 14.5. What a difference that makes during the worst of times. On the other hand, 2000 through 2002, another terrible bear market. The, the, once again, the S&P was down about 37. The all value uh, index down about 6.9. Now, it's starting to sound like financial nirvana. I know. But it isn't, because I can tell you that from 1995 to 1999, while the S&P 500 was compounding at about, um, what was it, 27%, uh, the value, all value portfolio was compounding at 11. Five years of underperformance by half, 
by more than half. Do you know what that does to people who think they, they, they think they're smart investors and they've done something that, that would make sense for the long term? And to them, five years is a long time. Unfortunately, with investing, a five years isn't. Small value, huge. Any of you that have read my article about how to turn $3,000 into $50 million, you know what I'm recommending to a newborn child. Put that money away into a small cap value fund or ETF when they're born. Leave it alone until they start doing the IRAs. Take the money out of that investment, put it into IRAs. Again, putting the uh, money into a Roth IRA in small cap value. That is a huge possible return. Why? Because you get the premiums of small, because small does better than large, and you get the premium of value because historically value does better than growth. And by the way, internationals also, the, the value do better than growth, and the small value do better than small growth in the international markets. So what's wrong with value stocks? Well, one company at a time, very risky. Also value can uh, do worse in the market than the S&P 500. That's not unusual. You get a bear market that everything goes down, like 2007 through 2009, and the S&P was down over 50, while value was down over 60. So there are times that value is not going to protect you. There, there, this is not financial nirvana. It's a smart long-term strategy, but it doesn't make you happy all the time. I guarantee it. And here's something else about large cap value. This would be true of any other major asset class. You go into it thinking you got something that's going to work. And yet there are periods like through uh, the 20 years ending 1998, when for the 1, 3, 5, uh, 10, 15, and 20 years, a large cap value underproduced large cap growth. What happened to all these smart academics who told me I was going to do better? By the way, it didn't mean you lost money. You just didn't get the premium. So you got to be ready for that. And that's not so easy. And I would say look out. Look out for value companies in a totally catastrophic market. Let's look at, let, let's look at, this is hard, not easy. Look at the results in 1929 to 1932. Uh, large cap value down 77%. Small cap value down 84. The S&P 500 down 61. Ever going to happen again? I don't know. How would I know? But that's the risk that's built into equities. You cannot get away from that. Which is why so many of us, particularly at my age, I'm half in stocks and half in bonds. I don't want to take that kind of, of a shot. By the way, in 1933, if you stuck around, large cap value was up 92, small cap value was up 125, and the S&P was up 54. Now what should you have in an all-value portfolio? Well, what I think is that most equity portfolios should combine U.S. and international, large and small, value and growth, and growth. What an all portfolio, value portfolio does is say, let's get rid of those blends. Let's get rid of the S&P, and let's get rid of the EFA. The, the, that's a similar international index. Let's get rid of small cap blend and just go with small cap value. And what you'd end up with is some large cap value in the U.S., some small cap value U.S., large cap value international, small cap value international, and a small slice of emerging markets value. And that portfolio, when you look at it in my fine-tuning table, and I hope you will, that portfolio adds about 2% a year to the S&P 500 at almost exactly the same standard deviation, the same volatility. Remember, I'm looking for the best unit of return per unit of risk, and the wonderful thing is that it can all be indexed. You could do it with ETFs. You can do it with uh, index mutual funds. You don't, have to, you don't have to hire an active manager to be able to do this. But even if you don't want to do an all-value portfolio, 
I definitely think you should have value in your diversified portfolio and in a way more significant way than you're going to get, for example, in those uh, target date funds at Vanguard. I'm 50-50, stocks and bonds. My 50% in, in stocks is, is, is more than half in value. It's 50%, by the way, in small cap and 50% in large but I've got more value than I do growth in my portfolio. Not, but I haven't thrown growth out. And the reality is that even for a retiree, it makes sense to have some value. How much is going to depend on you. One of the things I do is, is I, I show tables of returns that are 50-50 value, some returns that are all value, some returns that are 70% U.S., 30% international, some 50% U.S., 50% international. You have to determine uh, what's going to feel right for you. Let's talk about using the values as a diversifier. First of all, uh, no, excuse me, I, did, I, I went over that, I apologize. Fine-tuning tables, some of the best work that I've done. Because by looking at those tables, and it's columns and columns and columns of, uh, of numbers, it looks at from 1970 through 2016, column, all fixed income, column, year-by-year -year results, 10% equities, 90% bonds, 20% equities, 80% bonds, 30% equities, all the way across to 100% equities. And the reason I do that is so people can look at the returns over the long period of time and the losses. I always guarantee people who follow my advice that you will, as you will experience losses. I don't know how to get around that uh, without having all your money in cash. And then, of course, you've got inflation as your loser. But here's what I know about looking kind of bottom line at comparing the all value to the worldwide uh, uh, portfolio that's big and small and value and growth and compared to the S&P 500 that from 1970 to 2016 the hundred percent equity portfolio the S&P made 10.3 the worldwide portfolio 11.4 the all value worldwide portfolio 12.1 and look at the standard deviation Virtually the same. The volatility is virtually the same in terms of, of, of the risk. But remember, risk is measured on the upside as well as the downside. On the upside, the worldwide and the all-value are, are, are more productive. On the downside, they can also lose more money, as you can see from the 12-month losses. But the overall volatility is about the same over that uh, period of years. And the return of the all value, uh, almost 2% more. Let's look at a balanced portfolio, kind of like what a retiree would look like, okay? What would a retiree look like? Well, many of them are 60-40. I'm 50-50, but I'm just a big chicken. I, I just don't want to take any more risk than I feel I have to because I'm one of those people who always think there's some sort of a catastrophic, catastrophic event right around the corner. But many of the clients when I was an advisor had 60-40, 60, 60 equity, 40 fixed income in their portfolio. And what I know, of course, with that is the volatility is going to go down and look at the standard deviation. It goes down to around nine, nine and a half. So you've cut your volatility by about a third. And look what happens to the return over that 70 to 2016 period. The S&P 9.3, 9.6 for the worldwide and 10 for the all value. Now you may be thinking that's not a big deal, the difference between 9.3 and 10. But I'm going to show you how big a deal that is. Actually, it's absolutely huge. Because in that supplemental package that I have provided to you, you got tons of stuff on distributions. I mean, we've got to accumulate, 
And yes, that's two-thirds of our life approximately accumulating money to retire. But when we retire, it's really mostly about taking distributions. So my job as an educator is to show people the implications of different combinations of asset classes in the accumulation period as well as the distribution period. And here's some bottom line numbers, I'm, I'm sure. Many of you CPAs are going to love these tables. There must be 16 tables in the package uh, showing different distribution strategies. Fixed distribution and variable distributions. Fixed means this. And in this particular case from, from this uh, slide here, we're assuming a $1 million investment in 1970. We're assuming taking out the first of each year $40,000 and adjusting it upwards every year based on real inflation from 1970 through 2016. And look what happened with the S&P 500. During that period of time, you would have taken out $6.9 million. Well, by the way, you would have taken out $6.9 million from all three of the strategies. And I'm talking 60-40 here. This is not all equities. You would have taken out 6.9 from the S&P and from the worldwide and from the all value. And the reason you would is because you, you, you chose to take the route of a fixed distribution plus inflation. So it didn't matter what happened to your portfolio. What happened, of course, was was there enough there to support the needs over that period of time, and they all distributed the 6.9 million. They all made it to the bottom line. But what about your heirs at that bottom line? If you were in the S&P 500, remember 9.3, you leave about 3.5 million. If you're in the worldwide equity strategy, you leave about 15 million. And if you're in the all-value portfolio, you leave about 19 million. That's why it's so important. I don't care where we find extra returns from low expenses, from low turnover, from the right asset classes, from the strategy we use to, to take distributions. It makes a difference. And of course, the longer we live, or let's say the earlier we retire, the bigger impact it's going to have over a lifetime. And it's all about accumulating, taking it out, and leaving to others. And I want people to do all three in style. Now that was fixed. Variable. It's different. Variable is what my wife and I use. See, we oversave, and I think that's important. Whenever I could get a, a client, an investor, to oversave, I always did that because it, it, it gives you some wiggle room. But we oversaved enough that instead of taking 4% out, we take out 5%. But what if we took out 4% of whatever that portfolio was worth at the end of each year? So if the value of the portfolio went down, we get 4% the next year of that. Forget about inflation. Inflation is not part of this discussion. Right here, all we're talking about is, is being able, willing to either adjust our lifestyle downward or to adjust our lifestyle upward based on a percentage. And in the pile of tables, I show you four. Um, in fact, I show you three, four, five, and six. And the difference is that you get automatic raises when the market goes up. And sometimes they're big. And sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's a, cut and, it's a cut and pay because you're taking a percentage of what's left over at the end of each year. You don't take it at the end of the year. You take it the first day of the next year. Look what you would have taken in distributions with the S&P, with the worldwide, with the all value. Again, 60-40. The total distributions with the S&P, 8.5. Remember, it was 6.9 before. And what you'll find when you look at these tables is this is much, much less risky because you have a defensive strategy to protect against giving away or taking out too much when the market goes down. S&P again, 8.5, worldwide strategy. Remember, big, small, value growth, U.S. international, includes a growth, 10.5, and the all value, 11.9. But look what's left over for the family. 
For the S&P, you're left with 9.5. Remember, you were left with 3.5. All of a sudden, the S&P is okay. I think you could do better. Well, I know you would have done better, but there's no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. But the top payout to the family was 12.8. So these are huge, huge decisions we make about accessing the money in retirement. And I do hope, I do hope you will take the time to go through these different tables. And the whole idea here uh, for me, I, I know the title said everything you need to know about value investing. I, I can't teach you everything you need to know in 45 minutes. I can teach you the basics, but I think it's important for you to dig a little deeper if you want to have the confidence, particularly for those of you who are in the business of giving advice to others. And that, by the way, doesn't mean professionally. Many of you are in the business of giving your family advice. And this is some important advice that I hope you will take the time to dig deep because we've got the fine-tuning tables in that handout material for S&P, worldwide, all value, Worldwide 70-30, worldwide 50-50, that's U.S. international, all value 70-30, and all value 50-50. It's a ton of information, and of course, as I mentioned before, all of those, um, um, those tables on distributions. Now, in the bylaws of my Financial Education Foundation, it states... No officer or director will receive any compensation. In other words, I am here today and I am doing what I do every day with zero compensation for that work. And I mention that because when I tell you that you can go to our website, which is for educational purposes only, I do not give personal advice to anybody. But I will tell them at Vanguard, at Fidelity, at T. Rowe Price with mutual funds, at Schwab and Fidelity and Vanguard, and TD Ameritrade with ETFs. In fact, I am even today uh, offering portfolios using what we call best-in-class ETFs. Go anywhere you want to to get the best small value, the best, you know, all of these different asset classes and which is, at least through my eyes and the eyes of the people working with me here, are the best ETFs to be in. I mention this because you don't have to do all of this on your own. You can look at what I'm recommending. And if you want to be smart, you can add, you can detract, but use it as a base. At least consider it. So what is it we have to do to have a better future and hopefully better returns, not only in terms of having peace of mind, but leaving more to others. It's always going to start, I think, knowing yourself. You always got to know who you are. But then you start looking for the best equity asset classes. And I think there's a ton of evidence of the asset classes that have historically added value. A ton of evidence. All academic. You don't have to go to Wall Street to find this. And then you, you have to figure out what's the right balance of equities and fixed income. I don't care whether you're in ETFs or mutual funds, even individual stocks. That combination is, is, is so important because according to the academics, it is that combination, what equity asset classes and how much you have in equities and fixed income, forget about stock picking or market timing, 90 to 99 percent of what you get is going to come from those basic decisions about asset allocation. Then you got to de determine whether that what's comfortable for you in terms of your risk will get you where you want to go. And there's always a question of where you're going to get the information and the data and all of that. Well, let me recommend some people I think put out some good work. Morningstar.com is amazing for people who want to dig into how to find the best ETFs, how to find the best mutual funds. Remember, 
It's all about the past. But you, when you see that some fun families, some fun families terribly underperform other fun families, you think that's just a random event? Once you learn how to use Morningstar, you will learn that is not a random event. I mentioned DFAUS.com here because these, these are the academic people that I have huge respect for, Dr. Fama, Dr. French, and others. And read what they have to say, not only about value and small cap and large cap and growth, but about asset allocation. Uh, it it most, mostly comes out of the academic community. Of course I want you to read my articles, listen to my podcast. I mean, anybody who believes like I believe in what they're doing, they want everybody to read it. Well, try it and see if it fits. Bogleheads.org. Now, it's, it, it, it's a chance for people who are great John Bogle fans to debate kind of what, what works best using Vanguard. Well, what works best using Vanguard will probably also work best using other sources of mutual funds that offer indexes. And then two people that I, I just think do a bang-up job in being true to what's right for you. One is Larry Swedrow. Larry Swedrow writes books and articles and has done a ton of research on, on value. He's probably done more than I have, maybe not as much as Dr. Fama and Dr. French, but he is one smart cookie, and I, I love his writings. It's clear, it's entertaining, and I think you'll learn. And Jason Zweig, it's hard to find a financial writer that isn't somehow biased. Well, everybody's got a bias, but a lot of people have a conflict of interest if you dig deep enough. And he's in the Wall Street Journal every week, and I think his work is just fine. In fact, I, I, my hope is that you will have a chance to read uh, his, uh, your money and your brain. And I'm always available. Well, my wife would say I'm always available because <laughs> I jump at 4 o'clock in the morning ready to answer emails, work on Saturday and Sunday. This is the kind of retirement that I like, and I'm having a ball, and I love to help. I, I, I write a, a column on a regular basis at marketwatch.com. Come uh, visit me there as well, and there's a chance to comment and either ask questions or tear me apart or tell me I'm doing something.